Welcome to Christian Family Church of Santa Maria, California. We're glad you joined us today. Uh, we are going to be teaching on Acts chapter 24 this evening. And if you would like to see more of our sermons, you can go to YouTube. And if you'll type in the search line, one word, starting with a capital C, Christian Family 324, all of our messages will come up. Before we start our study this evening, would you bow your heads with me and let's pray. Father, we thank you for the time we can spend together this evening studying your word. Father, as we look into Acts chapter 24, speak to us, encourage us, and I pray you'll give us direction. Thank you, Father, for teaching us this evening. I pray a blessing over each and every one who hears these messages, and I pray you'll send them far and wide to encourage others. We ask that in Jesus' name, Lord. Amen. Amen, and God bless you. Please pass these uh, sermons on to others who might need encouragement in the body of Christ. You're more than welcome to pass them forward. Let's take a look at Acts chapter 24. This chapter talks about the Apostle Paul being, being before the governor Felix. So it starts in verse 1. After five days, Ananias the high priest descended with the elders and with a certain order named Tertullus, who informed the governor against Paul. Here's just yet another group against the Apostle Paul preaching the truth. Verse 2 says, When he was called forth, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, Seeing that by thee we enjoy great quietness, and that very worthy deeds are done unto this nation by thy providence. So now he's buttering up uh, Felix, the governor. He said, We accept it always and in all places, most noble Felix, with all thankfulness. Notwithstanding that I be not further tedious unto thee, I pray that you would hear us of your clemency for a few words. For we have found this man a pestilent fellow and a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes who also has gone about to profane the temple whom we took and would have judged according to our law. But the chief captain Lysias came upon us and with great violence he took Paul away out of our hands commanding his accusers to come unto you by examining of whom yourself you may take knowledge of all these things whereof we accuse him. And the Jews also assented, saying that these things were so. So let's go through verse 9 to start with, and then we'll continue from there. In verse 1, the Jews bring an attorney who is well-versed in Roman law in order to bring charges against Paul before the governor, Felix. So they've chosen a well-spoken man to come. And you know, I just want to say this before we start this study. It's not who's well-spoken. It's who speaks the truth. We've had past leaders, past governors who have been very smooth talkers, but they were deceitful and they were liars. And they caused the people to be under great burdens. And this seems to be what's happening here in Acts chapter 24 with Paul, they found someone who's an attorney, who's well-spoken, who's a smooth talker, but he's speaking nothing but lies. So let's take a look at 1 Peter chapter 4, 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 14. And I always believe when we teach the Word of God, it should apply to us in this day and age as well. These are great stories to study, but the question would be, how does this apply to us in our time? So in 1 Peter chapter 4, starting with verse 12, the scripture says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to test you, as though some strange thing were happening to you. You are to rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. If you were reproached, and Paul certainly was here in this chapter, if you were reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you. For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part he's evil spoken of, but on your part 
he is glorified. Jesus spoke this scripture in the book of Matthew. He said, Blessed are you when men persecute you and cast out your name as evil and say all manner of things against you falsely. For so did they persecute the prophets which were before you. But woe unto you when all men speak well of you, for so did they speak of the false prophets. So as a Christian, we can't expect everyone to agree with the truth. There will be many that will come against us, especially in our land, where people are just as deceived as they could possibly be by the fake news media, by all the uh, TV programs that are just full of violence and lies and extortion, all kinds of crazy things happening in our land. The Bible says, Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in God's law will he meditate day and night. And that's what we need to be doing. I believe as Christians, we need to shut off the TV, and we need to start spending more time in God's word so that we'll know the truth and not be sucked into all the lies that are so far spread among our people. In verses 2 through 9, the Jews bring their case before Felix the governor. We read that. But I'd like to go through some things. Verses 2 and 3, it's the attorney flattering Felix. So let's take a look at what God has to say about flattery. In Psalm chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, Psalms, the book of Psalms in the middle of your Bible, and if you look at Psalm 5, verses 8 and 9, the scripture says, Lead me, O Lord, in righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before my face. Because there is no faithfulness in their mouth. That could also be interpreted, there's no truth in what they say. There's no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is very wickedness. Their throat is an open sepulcher. They flatter with their tongue. I was on a Zoom meeting uh, with some people in San Diego last night. One of our state senators was also on that uh, Zoom meeting. And one of the things that was discussed is in San Diego, there were two banks that were burned to the ground. Chase Bank and Union Bank were both burned to the ground. And both of those banking companies put up signs outside their burned buildings that said, due to fire, this bank is no longer in operation. Well, the Christians in that community went by and put signs that said, you can thank Antifa and Black Lives Matter that these buildings are burned to the ground. And now they say people that drive by see those signs and honk and give a thumbs up like, yeah, we want to hear the truth. Man, it's so interesting how the truth is so veiled nowadays. Uh, think about this. Those buildings were burned by looters. They were burned by rioters. Uh, that wasn't a peaceful protest. It was a violent uh, extortion against these banks. And so what happened is they burn them down and the companies afraid that they might suffer worse things. Well, due to fire, no, due to rioters who burned the building down, the building is no longer in use. And I believe that's what needs to come out in our society today. We see here in verses two and three, this attorney does the very same thing. He flatters Felix so that he can butter him up to tell him lies. Let's take a look at Psalm 12. You were in Psalm 5. If you'll turn to the right to Psalm 12. Psalm 12, verse 1. The scripture says, Help, Lord, for the godly man ceases, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. How appropriate is that for our time? Verse 2, they speak vanity, everyone with his neighbor, with flattering lips and a double heart do they speak. The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things, who have said, well, with our tongue we will prevail, our lips are our own, who is Lord over us. Interesting. 
Verses 3 through 6 in Acts chapter 24, the attorney for the Jews accuses Paul of stirring up dissension and even desecrating the temple. Paul didn't desecrate the temple. It was the people that threw a riot and started tearing things apart to get to Paul who desecrated the temple. So these are all false accusations. And I want to take a look at verses uh, in Acts chapter 21 verses 27 through 29. So we're in Acts chapter 24. If you'll just turn to the left back a couple of pages to Acts chapter 21, starting with verse 27. Now the scripture says, when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews, which were in Asia, when they saw Paul in the temple, they stirred up all the people and laid hands on him. They cried out and said, men of Israel, This is the man that teaches all men everywhere against the people and against the law and this place. And furthermore, he's brought Greeks also into the temple and has polluted this holy place. For they had seen him before in the city with Trophimus, an Ephesian, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. So I find it interesting that it was the Jews that stirred up the multitude. And then in verse 29, they supposed that Paul had brought in Trophimus into the temple instead of getting the facts. And so in verse uh, 7 through 9 of Acts chapter 24, the attorney even stretches the truth further by accusing even a Roman commander, whose name is Lysias, of, of stopping the justice that the Jews wanted to do to Paul. So here now, not only are they attacking Paul, but they're attacking uh, the governor's Roman soldiers for trying to protect him against the mob. Let's take a look at that. Acts chapter 23, Acts 23, verses 7 through 10. You'll remember this as we studied it last week. Uh, Let's start with verse 6. Now, when Paul perceived that one part of the Jews were Sadducees, they don't believe in the resurrection, And the other were Pharisees. He cried out on the council and said, Brethren, I'm a Pharisee. I'm the son of a Pharisee. Of the hope and resurrection of the dead, is that what I'm being called in question for? Verse 7. When he has said so, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. Verse 8 says, The Sadducees say there's no resurrection, neither an angel or spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. And there arose a great cry, and the scribes that were of the Pharisees' part arose and and fought with the others, saying, We find no evil in this man. But if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. And when there arose a great dissension, the chief captain, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled into pieces by them, the captain commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force among them and bring him to safety into the castle. So here again, the attorney stretches the truth by accusing the Roman commander of stopping justice. There was no justice. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were fighting amongst themselves. Again, more lies purported against the Apostle Paul. In verses chapter 10 through 21, I'd like to read those. We're back in Acts chapter 24, starting with verse 10 and going down through verse 24. Paul, after the governor had beckoned unto him to speak, answered, For as much as I know that you have been many years a judge for this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself, because that you may understand that there are yet but twelve days since I went up to Jerusalem for to worship. So here's Paul giving his uh, explanation of what really happened in the temple. Verse 12. They neither found me in the temple disputing with any man, neither raising up the people, neither in the synagogues or in the city. Neither can they prove the things that they now accuse me of. But I will confess this to you, that after the way which they call heresy, that's the way I worship the God of my fathers, believing all the things that are written in the law and in the prophets. And I have hope towards God that those themselves also allow that there would be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. And in this, I exercise myself, 
to have always a conscience void of offense towards God and towards men. Now after many years I came to bring alms to my nation and offerings, and whereupon these certain Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple, neither with multitude or with a tumult or a riot, who ought to have been here before you and object if they had something against me. Or else let these same ones here say if they have found any evil doing in me while I'm standing before the council. Except it be for this one voice that I cried standing among them, touching of the resurrection of the dead. And of course we read that in Acts 23 where Paul bid to the Pharisees, I believe the same thing you do in the resurrection of the dead, the just and the unjust. He said, by that I'm called into question by you this day. In verse 22, Felix, when he heard these things, having more perfect knowledge of that way or the way of Christ, he deferred them and said, when Lysias, the chief captain, shall come down, I'll know the uttermost of your matter. So it seems to me that Felix is doing an investigation here. It seems to me that Felix isn't just going to take the words of one side. He's going to get the entire story, so he invites the Roman commander to come. Verse 23, at that point he commanded a centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty, and that he would forbid no one of his acquaintances to come and minister or come to him. And so after certain days, when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, who was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Do you see how God opens the door for the gospel? Even amidst lies and deceit, they brought this crooked attorney to try and twist Felix's heart, and yet Felix is turned towards wanting to hear about the gospel from the Apostle Paul. So let's go back here and take a look. Paul gives his defense before Felix the governor. Okay? So in verses 10 through 13, Paul refutes the false charges of the Jews. So let's take a look at what those charges were and why they were false. Acts chapter 21, so we have to go back into a little bit of history of where all of this started. Acts chapter 21, starting with verse 26. The Bible says Paul took the men... And the next day he purified himself. Remember what what we just read? Paul said he was purified in the temple. So he took the man and purified himself with him and entered into the temple as to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification until an offering would be offered for every one of them. And the Bible goes on to say, when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews which were of Asia, when they saw him in the temple, they stirred up the people and laid hands on Paul. Notice it's interesting. They accused Paul of stirring up the people, but the account in Scripture shows that it was the Jews that stirred up the people. Verse 28. And they cried out, saying, Men of Israel, this is the man that teaches all men everywhere against the people and against the law, and this place, and further brought Greeks into the temple and has polluted this holy place. For they had seen him before in the city with Trophimus and Ephesian, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. So not only does Paul refute the false charges of the Jews, but then in verses 14 and 15 of Acts 24, Paul testifies that he certainly believes in the resurrection. And that was his defense. So in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, the Bible says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So the first thing I think this applies to our day and time, are we ashamed of the gospel of Christ? Because if we truly preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, it will confront the lies that are being purported all throughout our nation. It will, it will bring to light the hidden things of darkness. And you know what that brings? That brings persecution. And it makes me wonder why so many believers, so many preachers, so many people are trying to escape persecution when Jesus said, you have to pick up your cross and follow after me. If you try to save your life, you'll lose it. If you lose your life for my sake and the gospels, you'll save it. 
He said, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. If they hated me, they're going to hate you also because they hate him who sent me. And it's amazing to me how so many are trying to escape persecution. That's what we've been called into, brethren. So Paul refutes and testifies that he certainly believes in the resurrection. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he actually gives a discourse about the resurrection. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting with verse 1, Paul writes this to the church of Corinth regarding the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached to you, which you have received, and in which you stand, by which you are also saved, if you keep in memory those things that I preached to you, unless you have believed in vain. Because I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day, according to the Scriptures. That is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. In Romans chapter 10, verse 9, the Bible says, If you believe that God raised Jesus from the dead, and if you believe he's the Lord, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes into righteousness, and then with the mouth confession is made unto salvation, Romans 10.10. So Paul, first of all, gives the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. Verse 5, he says, and after that, Jesus was seen by Peter, and then by the twelve. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at one time, of whom the greater part remain unto the present, but some had fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James and then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me, Paul says, as one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, and I am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet it wasn't I, but it was the grace of God that was in me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Now, if Christ has preached that he rose from the dead, how are there some among you that say there is no resurrection of the dead? And I believe he's speaking to the Sadducees there. If there's no resurrection of the dead, Christ hasn't risen. And if Christ hasn't risen, then our preaching is in vain. And your faith also is in vain. Yea, and we would be found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom if he did not raise up, if it so be that the dead don't rise. Because if the dead don't rise, then Christ hasn't raised either. And if Christ hasn't raised, your faith is in vain, and you're yet in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have the hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead, and he has become the firstfruits of them who slept. So Paul gives a great defense on the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we go uh, through Acts chapter 24, And verses 16 through 21, we've already read all of those. Paul declares he's on trial because he believes in the resurrection. That's a great defense. And that's exactly why he was on trial. Because the Sadducees were upset because they don't believe in the resurrection. So they raised up an attorney to spread all kinds of lies about Paul. So let's go on in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Back to 1 Corinthians 15. And we're going to start in verse 20, where we said, Christ is now risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who slept. For since by man death came, by man also came the resurrection of the dead, the man Jesus Christ, of course. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. And then if you look at 
1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It's a further teaching on the resurrection from the dead, but it's those who have already passed. So in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, God addresses those who have already passed away and those who remain until his coming. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 13 says, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, or the word uninformed. I don't want you to be an uninformed, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, that you should not sorrow even as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even those who are asleep in Christ, God will bring them with him. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. He's talking about the dead bodies because Jesus is going to bring the living spirits to the clouds with him to be rejoined in their new bodies before we're all caught up together. So the scripture says the dead in Christ, the dead bodies will rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them into the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. The scripture tells us in verse 17 that we're caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And then he ends this chapter by saying, with these words, comfort one another. We should be comforted with the fact that the resurrection is real. In fact, Paul further explains it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if you'll turn back there with me. 1 Corinthians 15, starting with verse 51. Paul says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we're all going to be changed. In other words, those who have fallen asleep in Christ, their bodies will be changed and given a supernatural body. And we who are alive and remain will be given a supernatural body as well. Because the scripture says, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. In this flesh, with our blood, we can't go into heaven. We need a new body. So in verse 52, Paul explains to the church in Corinth that in a moment and in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible. The dead bodies are going to be raised incorruptible. And then the scripture says, we who are alive and remain, we're going to be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, verse 53. This mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then will be brought to pass the saying, death will be swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who has given us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. So what's our instruction from this? Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, and always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now I want to talk about the time we're living in now, in 2020. Because the churches have been shut down, because there's not as much fellowship as there was, we need to find inventive ways to meet again with one another. One of the things we do here in our church, we instead of having outdoor services, we do our services online for YouTube where you can watch them at your convenience during the week, three times a week. But the fellowship is important, so we have outdoor picnics at our church where people bring their own picnic lunch. We do it every other weekend, and people are really enjoying getting together with fellowship. There are some who are going to fall away. I believe with all of my heart, God is shaking the tree right now of Christianity. Everything that doesn't belong on the tree is going to fall off. Everything is going to fall away that is false 
or not real at all. And only the true believers will remain. And I believe that's exactly what God's doing in this day and age as he's shaking the tree. So as we look further into the scripture regarding why Paul is on trial because he believes in the resurrection, I want us to take a look at Revelation chapter 7. Because Revelation 7 reveals the time when we are caught up. The time when we are brought into heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe that time with all of my heart, if you study the scripture, comes before the wrath of God. Like 1 Thessalonians 5.9 says, God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's take a look. John is in heaven, the Apostle John. He's caught up in the spirit and sees into the future. God shows him the future. And after God seals 144,000 Jewish servants in their foreheads, all of a sudden John says in verse 9, After this I looked, and there was a great multitude which no man could number. So there's this huge group of people all of a sudden that appear in heaven. They were from all nations and kindreds and people and tongues. And they were standing before the throne and before the Lamb and they were clothed in white robes and they had palms in their hands. Now we know that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So we know that when we die, our body gets shed on this earth and our spirit and our soul go to heaven to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're a believer, if you're saved, your spirit and your soul will go into heaven. But here Paul describes people who were wearing white robes. So it's obvious they have bodies. They're waving palms in their hands. Spirits can't wave palms. They don't wear white robes. Only if you have a body can you wear a robe. So it's a perfect explanation of what we just studied in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through 58, where this mortal shall put on immortality. And this corruptible will put on incorruption and will be caught up together in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And, and John sees this in heaven. He says, that we cry with a loud voice saying, salvation to God who sits on the throne and under the Lamb. And all the angels round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts fall before the throne on their faces and worship God saying amen and blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Now John records this in verse 13. He says, One of the elders asked him, saying, Who are these who were dressed in the white robes? Where did they come from? So obviously they weren't there before. They were caught up in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. They were all caught up into heaven together from all nations and tongues and tribes and peoples and languages. Who are they? I believe it's the raptured saints off the earth. That's the only biblical explanation you can come up with. And that's found in Daniel chapter 12 through the book of Zechariah, in Matthew 24, in Luke chapter 21, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, all throughout the scripture talks about the taking away of the church. In verse 14, John says to him, Sir, you know. And the elder says, Yes, these are those who came out of great tribulation. Now that's why, that's where it comes into play. Study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that does not need to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. You have a lot of preachers in the land, and I pray that we will all begin to rightly divide the word of truth. So if you go to Strong's Concordance, and you look up the words out of great tribulation, you will come up with the Greek word ek, E-K. We get our word exit from that word. In other words, that word ek means away from. Not out of the middle of, but away from great tribulation. So when you read it the way it reads in the Greek, it reads this way. They are those that came away from great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And therefore they will be before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sits on the throne 
will dwell among them. Praise God for the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, which gives us hope for our resurrection. Now, in closing our study this evening, in verses 22 through 27, Governor Felix puts off judging the accusations against the Apostle Paul. So let's take a look at Acts chapter 24. We're back in Acts chapter 24. And we want to start with verse 22. And when Felix heard these things, having a more perfect knowledge of that way or the way of Christ, he deferred them and said, when Lysias, the chief captain, comes down, I'll know the uttermost, or I'll know more clearly about this matter. Verse 23. He commanded a centurion to keep Paul to let him have liberty, that he would forbid none of his acquaintances to minister or come unto him. And after certain days, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, she was a Jewess, he sent for Paul, and he heard him concerning his faith in Christ. And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled. In other words, he was under conviction. The word of God puts people under conviction. And he answered and said, Go your way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I want to call back for you. So he hoped that money would have been given to Paul that he might loose him. And, and uh, he sent for him one of the, uh, for him off more often and communed with him. But after two years, Porcius Festus came to Felix's room. And Felix, willing to show the Jews a pleasure, he let Paul stay in his chains or stay bound. So I want to take a look at those verses. In verse 22, Felix tells the Jews to wait until he has uh, heard from Lysias, the Roman commander. So he's doing a more thorough investigation here. Let's take a look at Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 13. I think that would apply in this case. Proverbs, right after the book of Psalms. Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 13 says, Whoever answers a matter before he hears it, it is foolishness and shame unto him. You know, it's interesting. There are two sides to every story. There's the lie, and then there's the truth. And unfortunately, what happens in our day and age, there's more lies being told over the internet, over TV, over the fake news media, that people rarely get a chance to hear the other side, which is the truth. And so, again, whoever answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly or foolishness and shame unto him. And then let's take a look at Proverbs 21 and verse 1. The Bible tells us that the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. And just like the rivers of water, God can turn it whatever way he wishes. And that's one of the things we need to pray for our leaders in our country is that God will turn their heart to do what's right instead of doing otherwise. So in verse 23, Felix orders Paul to be kept in custody, but also gives him freedom to be ministered to by his friends. So we're in Proverbs. Take a look at Proverbs 16 and verse 7. Proverbs 16, 7 says, When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. So I want to park right there for just a minute and just say this. I believe as preachers and teachers of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we have one allegiance, and that's to the Lord God. He commands us to preach his word, to be faithful in preaching his word, to reprove, to rebuke, and to exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. So we either please God or we please people. You're never going to please all the people. It's best and it's right to please God. Those who love God will love you. Those who hate God will hate you no matter what you say. So when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. And we see this with the Apostle Paul. Because his ways pleased the Lord, God opened the door 
for the Apostle Paul to be free and let his friends come and minister to him and for him to minister as well. And let's take a look at 2 Chronicles chapter 17. If you'll turn in your Bibles with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 17. We're going to go through verses 1 through 12. We're talking about King Jehoshaphat reigning well in Israel. Now Jehoshaphat and his son reigned in his stead and strengthened himself against Israel. He placed forces in all the fenced cities of Judah and set garrisons in the land of Judah and the cities of Ephraim, which Asa his father had taken. And the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he walked in the ways of his father David and sought and did not seek unto Balaam. But he sought to the Lord God of his father, and walked in his commandments, not after the doings of Israel. Therefore the Lord established the kingdom in his hand, and all Judah brought to Jehoshaphat presents. He had riches and honor in abundance, and his heart was lifted up in the ways of the Lord. Moreover, he took away the high places, or the places of false worship, out of Judah. One of the things that you may not have noticed as we read this scripture in verse 2, he placed forces in all the fenced cities of Judah and garrisons in the land of Judah. In other words, he set up boundaries. He set up a wall. He set up boundaries to protect his country. He was a wise king because he listened to the Lord. In verse 7, also in the third year of his reign, he sent to his princes and unto ben Hail and unto Obadiah, and Zechariah, and to Nathanael, and to to Micaiah, to teach in the cities of Judah. And with them he sent Levites, even Shemaiah, and Nathiah, and Zebediah, and Ashel, and Shemaroth, and Jonathan, and Adonijah, and Tobijah, and Tob Adonijah, Levites, and with them Elishama, and Jehoram, the priests. And they taught in Judah and had the book of the law of the Lord with them. And they went about throughout all the cities of Judah and taught the people. Man, if we ever needed Bible teaching, that's why we need it now. We need Bible teaching in the land. You know what the scripture says? I have so many people saying, why are people so gullible? Why are they believing the lie? Well, there's a very simple explanation. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10 through 12, the Bible says, Now with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in those who are perishing, because they would not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved, God will send them a strong delusion. And they're going to believe the lie. Because they would not believe the truth, but rather had pleasure in unrighteousness. So we have two choices on this earth. You either believe the truth or God's going to send you a strong delusion and you're going to believe the lie. And that's why we have so many people that are so deceived and believe the lie, even though it makes no sense to any of us who believe the truth. They're believing the lie because God sent them a strong delusion. Thus saith the Lord. 2 Thessalonians 2, 10 through 12. Romans 3, 4 says, Let God be true and every man a liar. Verse 10 says, the fear of the Lord fell upon all the kingdoms. These priests were going around reading the word of God everywhere. It's interesting. We've taken the Bibles out of schools. We've taken prayer out of schools. We've taken righteousness out of our courthouses. No wonder our land is upside down. But here in Jehoshaphat's land, the Bible says the fear of the Lord fell on all the kingdoms of the lands that were round about Judah, so that they made no war against Jehoshaphat at all. Also, some of the Philistines brought Jehoshaphat presents as well. Silver and the Arabians brought him flocks, 7,700 rams and 7,700 e-goats. And Jehoshaphat became great exceedingly. And he built in Judah some castles and some cities of storehouses. So it's real interesting when you follow the Lord, when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Such is the case with Paul. Verses 24 through 27. Paul preaches the whole truth to Felix. 
And that's what frightens Felix. Remember when we read the scripture in Acts 24? The Bible says Felix trembled and sent him back to his cell and said, I'll talk with you more about this later. When people hear the preaching of the truth, there's two responses. You either accept it or you come against it. You know, the Bible says we do greatly err. Mark chapter 12 and verse 24, Jesus said, you do greatly err not knowing the scriptures or the power of God. And when the power of God comes forth in God's holy word, people either accept it and agree with God's word or they get upset and they leave and they get angry and they speak against the speaker. And it just shows you what's happening in our land today. The same that happened to Felix when Paul preached to him. So let's take a look at John chapter 16. I like what the Apostle Paul said to the Galatians. After he spoke the truth to him, he said in Galatians 4.16, Am I therefore become your enemy because I have taught you the truth? That's so apropos for today. I've become some people's enemies because I speak the truth. That's on you, not on me. I speak the truth. I'm pleasing to God. You're upset with the truth. That's between you and the Lord. Proverbs 16, or excuse me, John 16, starting with verse 7. Jesus said, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. If I don't go away, the Comforter won't come. But if I leave, I will send him to you. And when he's come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they don't believe on me, of righteousness because I'm going to my Father and you won't see me anymore, and of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. And then let's take a look at Jude. Now that's right before the book of Revelation. So if you go to the last book in your Bible, the book of Revelation, just one page to the left is the book of Jude. In the book of Jude, there's only one chapter. I'd like to take a look at verse 21 through 23. The scripture tells us as believers, we are to keep ourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And on some, we're to have compassion. That's going to make a difference. But the scripture says in verse 23, others, you must save them with fear. Pulling them out of the fire, hating even their garment that's spotted by the flesh. Another version says their clothing that's spotted by sin. So I think what's lacking in the land is the preaching of the fear of God. The Bible says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Everyone wants to hear that God is merciful and God is loving and God is gracious, and He is. But God is also judge. He's a God of wrath and a God of judgment as much as He is a God of love and a God of mercy. And when you leave out half the gospel, you're going to have men's blood on your hands. Just like the scripture says in Acts chapter 20, when Paul declared, I am free from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to preach unto you all the counsel of God. I think the most famous verse in scripture that most Christians know is John 3.16. I find it interesting in John 3.16 that Jesus mentions wrath before he mentions salvation. Listen to the verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God speaks of hell and the fear of God first and then he promises eternal life to those who believe. Interesting. And then in Hebrews chapter 10, if you'll turn there with me, Hebrews In the 10th chapter, we're going to look at verse 30 and 31. The Bible says, We know him that has said, Vengeance belongs to me. I will 
repay, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. Verse 31 says, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. It causes me to tremble when I hear people speak great swelling words against the living God and against Christians and against the way of truth. Because the Bible says in Mark 8, 38, every idle word that men will speak, they will give an account for it in the day of judgment. God says, for by your words you'll be justified, but by your words you will be condemned. Jesus Christ said those words in the book of Mark. By your words you'll be justified, but by your words you'll be condemned. And then as we end this study this morning, Felix continues, Governor Felix continues to, to uh, have conversations with Paul, but in order to please the Jews, he leaves Paul in prison. So you can't walk both roads. You either walk in the light or you walk in darkness. You don't play both sides. You either please God or you please people. If you please God, you'll please the people who love God. You'll never please the people who don't love God because it doesn't matter what you say, they'll twist your words and they'll hate you. Remember what Jesus said? If they hated me, they're going to hate you. If they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you also. It's time for us to wake up in the body of Christ and realize we're not here to please people. We're here to please the Lord and to preach His truth. And I'm telling you right now, Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. This is the time for us to turn away from our sins and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. Today is the day of salvation. Now it's the time. I believe God is on the way to come and take us off this earth. I believe the Lord is at the doors. Soon and very soon, I believe we will see our King. The only way out, the only way of escape Jesus said it in John 14. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Those are the words of Jesus, not mine. So Felix continues to have conversations with Paul, but he's double-minded. And the Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. He's like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. The scripture says, let not that man think that he shall receive anything from the Lord. So let's take a look at Galatians chapter 1, the book of Galatians, and the first chapter as we close here. I'd like to start with verse 8. The Apostle Paul tells the church in Galatia, even if we or an angel from heaven preaches any other gospel to you, that's the death, burial, and resurrection, any other gospel is a false gospel. You know, like the gospels that are purported, God wants to make you rich. God wants to do all these great things for you. God is not a heavenly bellhop that we just call when we need something. God is greatly to be feared in the congregation of the saints. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. And Paul puts it this way, if you preach another gospel, let him be accursed. That scripture comes from Anathema Maranatha, found in uh, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 22. It means, let him be cursed to the lake of fire for eternity. That's what it means. Eternal curse. Verse 9. Paul says, as we said before, so I say it again. If any man preaches any other gospel unto you other than what you have received, let that man be accursed. Strong words. Verse 10. Paul said, do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? If I please men, I cannot be the servant of God. Let me repeat that. If I please men, I cannot be the servant of God. Finally, we're going to end with Proverbs chapter 29, the book of wisdom. 
Proverbs 29, starting with verse 25. A lot of this going on in our country. The fear of man bringeth a snare. But whoever puts his trust in the Lord will be safe. Many people seek the, the, the ruler's favor. But every man's judgment comes from the Lord. I think that's very interesting. Your judgment comes from the Lord, not from the ruler. Your judgment comes from the Lord. Therefore, your decision should be made to please the Lord, not the ruler. Your judgment comes from the Lord. The fear of man brings a snare. Whosoever puts their trust in the Lord will be safe. So I want to go back over briefly what we learned today. The Jews bring an attorney who's a smooth talker before Felix to accuse Paul. He attorneys this attorney flatters the governor Felix. He flatters him. And then he accuses Paul of stirring up dissension and desecrating the temple, which are all false accusations. It was actually the Jews that stirred up the multitude. But the attorney stretches the truth even further by accusing even a Roman commander named Lysias of stopping justice to be done on Paul. So Paul then is called before Felix and he gives his defense before the governor. Paul refutes those false charges of the Jews by giving him the facts. Paul testifies that he, cert that he certainly believes in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and he believes in the resurrection. Paul declares that he's on trial because he believes in the resurrection. Felix listens to him. And he puts off judging the accusations against the Apostle Paul. And he tells the Jews to wait until he hears from Lysias, the Roman commander. And then Felix orders Paul to be kept in custody, but also gives him freedom to be visited by his friends and his ministers. Remember, when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. And then Paul preaches the whole truth to Felix. But Felix, remember, he trembles. He becomes frightened. That's exactly what happens when the word of God is preached. You either agree and submit to God, or you run away. In closing, Felix continued to converse with Paul, but then he also tried to please the Jews by keeping him in prison. You can't have it both ways. Jesus said, you cannot serve God and mammon. You will either hate the one and love the other one, or you hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. I think there's some great lessons in here and some great lessons to be taken for the time that we're living in here in our country. I pray the Lord will help you to restudy this and see if these things aren't so. God bless you and thank you for joining us. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for the time we've spent together today. And ask, Lord God, that you would bless this word as it goes out over the airwaves. I pray that it will be spread far and wide to those who need to hear the truth of God, the message of encouragement and enlightenment, and those who need to be warned against the lies that are being spoken all across our land. Lord, I thank you for giving me the boldness to confront those things that are wrong. That's far too long in our country. The truth has not really been spread forth and the lies have not really been confronted. And now is the time when you're separating the true from the false. So help us to continue to preach the truth and expose the lies. Bless your people, Lord. Encourage them. Thank you for this time we've had to study your word. I ask it in Jesus' holy name. Amen. God bless you and thank you for joining us.